Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eduardo Madrid. I'm going to be the presenter about uh, how to do a little bit of introspection in uh, C++, applied it to market data, financial market data. I have a kind of a, an ambitious program, so I will have to go fast. And uh, for uh, the people that is concerned whether this is a presentation that assumes uh, financial knowledge, it isn't. It's going to be practical. It's going to be mostly about uh, C++ metaprogramming techniques to accomplish the introspection and gain benefits from it. I think I should uh, explain why the title. My title is uh, quite a mouthful. So uh, when I refer to ultimate performance, well, uh, we are adults. We know that uh, that is not attainable. What I mean is that uh, we are going to approach how to get more performance when we have done everything else right by uh, the use of introspection. And um, introspection don't, doesn't only give us uh, performance, or at least uh, this approach that I am trying to present to you will not give us just performance, but it's going to give us all the benefits as well. We will talk about those. And um, uh, why introspection may help? Well. The general idea is that uh, uh, these techniques are to help the compiler understand better what's going on. What is it that uh, the program is going to be executing at runtime? In that way, the compiler will be able, hopefully, to micro-optimize more than otherwise. The, um, the presentation, I hope, uh, is going to be of uh, practical importance or practical use for uh, the attendees. Um, we're going to see, I'm going to give you a glimpse of uh, the full complexity of uh, the market data that uh, a very important uh, financial exchange provides to further emphasize the, na the practical nature of uh, the techniques that I'm going to be talking about. Um, for financial data, in the case of uh, what we do at the company that I work for, performance is important, of course, uh, literally money is on the line. And um, I hope that uh, these techniques uh, are not going to be just an exercise to accomplish uh, what uh, the subject of representation is, but uh, they, they are useful in a more general way. All right. So compile time introspection. What do I mean by that? Um, uh, introspection is a facet of uh, the more general topic of uh, reflection. But it refers to only when the, the, the program is reflecting about itself without the intention of changing things. Like, for instance, typically, that we will talk about uh, in a minute, iterating over the members of a class is just reflecting about uh, what are the members of a particular class. There's no, 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 no need to change anything. So that self-inspection process that the code reasons about itself without changing is uh, introspection. The way to accomplish these things uh, require the more general subject of uh, metaprogramming. So we we're going to be seeing metaprogramming techniques applied to introspection and uh, to the objectives that I set up in a bit. Well, um, I come from Crable Capital Management. It is a large trader of futures. Um, it is an eager consumer of uh, the type of market data that we are going to be talking about. For us, the performance is important. We work uh, on a Linux environment. We do automated trading. Um, we have to be conservative about uh, toolchain versions. So unfortunately, we cannot adopt uh, the very latest uh, when as soon as it is released, unless to do testing and perhaps some isolated uh, production deployments. Um, we don't require C++ 14 if we don't need to. But uh, if, if we need, we're open. And um, uh, I am really thankful because uh, it made this presentation possible. I have gotten uh, a stellar sponsorship. Um, I want to be uh, participating more in the community. So please, please uh, feel free to contact me offline after the presentation. Um, I am a senior developer because I have a very long history developing in C++. Um, I have been educating people about C++, and I teach uh, the modern way of uh, programming in C++ as opposed to the old one, and uh, 
I get very upset when uh, people try to tell me that uh, C++ is as it used to be 20 years ago. Um, I am also a blogger, and um, I'm going to take the liberty to blog a couple of times to my blog. And uh, one of the reasons that enabled me to come to um, introduce these ideas to you, hopefully that is going to be novel, is because I carry experience with uh, functional programming and uh, logical programming, especially, especially Prolog. And I think they are very relevant to C++ uh, metaprogramming templates and uh, all the whatnot. The reason being, like for instance, we're going to see that uh, at the gist of it all, pattern matching is extremely important when you do metaprogramming. And uh, pattern matching relies on the overload rules of the language, which are extremely complex. So learning pattern matching through the rules of overload of C++ is extremely hard. So perhaps it is a good idea to come from a different uh, 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 background in which uh, those things are more uh, natural. Um, you will be surprised, but uh, I have less than three years doing uh, metaprogramming. Um, what happened was that um, when I was uh, uh, interviewed at uh, the job that I have currently, one of my uh, later co-workers asked me a metaprogramming question, and um, I sort of uh, was able to answer it, but uh, um, I did it. And um, it, that was uh, um, the seed of, um, of uh, interest that uh, brought me to this subject, because um, whether it has practical application or not is something that uh, we're going to be talking about, and I hope that um, I help you to persuade that it may have practical application more than, than uh, you were thinking before. And Rohan, if you're looking at this presentation, I hope that this finds you well. Um, the, um, the point is that, uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, a presentation for beginners, because we're going to be uh, going over several different um, uh, subject matters that uh, assume understanding of them. Uh, in, in particular, specializations and um, overload resolutions. And um, if uh, you also know what is a substitution failure is not an error, metaprogramming, type injection, evaluated context, uh, void T, um, and, and so, some other concepts, uh, it, it will be uh, more helpful to you and um, um, you will get a little bit more of the substance of uh, what I'm going to. If uh, uh, I'll drop you at any time during the presentation. Um, I hope that uh, you will see that uh, even if you did not understand that part, later on when it is used, you just know that uh, there is something that accomplished something. And uh, yes? Uh, yeah, I just was thinking, is it going to be actually a C++ 17 standard? Uh, yes. It is totally available in any version of C++ that I know of, okay. uh, because you can implement it yourself trivially, and we will see that. Okay. Just wondering, sure. Not not in the standard yet, but the concepts behind uh, are uh, applicable today. All right. What if you don't know of uh, the advanced topics that I just mentioned? Uh, don't be afraid. When uh, the time comes, I will explain what they do. And uh, you may not catch all of the details of how they do it or what are the different possibilities that you have about it. But um, it will be something that, uh, that um, it will be understandable in the context of uh, the rest of the code. And. Um, um, I have to report that, unfortunately, metaprogramming does have complications. It is uh, kind of hard to get it right sometimes. OK. How can introspection help a programmer? Well, I'm not going to go about the theoretical discussion. Um, keeping the emphasis on the practical application, I am going to just show several examples. Serialization is one of those examples. It is a frequently used feature. When uh, uh, 
it is uh, so common that uh, you want to persist your data. And to persist your data, you, not, you need to know uh, its internal structure. And uh, knowing the internal structure, if you could do it uh, within the program itself, then that would be introspection and would be helpful. Frequently, when you have um, um, uh, the serialization requirement is that you're going to iterate for each piece of data over all of its members and uh, recursively apply the serialization. So it's a shame that, uh, unfortunately, in C++, uh, we don't have any facility to iterate over the members of a class, nor we have a, a facility that will tell us what are the names, the identifiers used for the classes and the members. So this only gives us two options uh, uh, at 2016. Number one is uh, to do it through code generators, even if you are the code generator yourself, well, but it's gonna be code generators because uh, it is boilerplate code. Or you can use preprocessor macros, which is uh, its own set of evils. Um, this presentation has, a, has an objective uh, uh, inspiring you to uh, come up with your building blocks so that uh, when you need to do introspection, you make a very simple code generators. Let us start with a very simple example. We have a structure that I call it aggregate because that's what it is, an aggregate of two different data elements, has an integer that has a string. All right, how do we convert it to a string? We have many choices. If we want to be very thorough, maybe we want to put the name of the structure that the data item belongs to, in this case, the string aggregate, and uh, for each member, we may want to say, okay, this is the name of the member and uh, colon, the value of the member. This is what uh, anybody would do, including a code generator manually. So the intended uh, output would be like uh, you can read over there. By the way, does everybody is able to read uh, from the distance? Thank you. Um, so, um, what are the properties of uh, this uh, first uh, attempt that we have uh, programmed? Well, it is encoded, of course. Because it is encoded, you can make it maximally efficient. You can make it as efficient as, you, as possible. But unfortunately, it is brittle. Because uh, anything that changes about the definition of uh, the structure, the aggregate, affects the serialization. And you might make it uh, incompatible, and uh, your test may run or uh, your compiler compile, no problem. So it is kind of uh, uh, tricky because the real problem is that the names of the members and the name of the aggregate itself and the role that they play are pieces of information that are not linked together in the language in any way. So to instrument uh, reflection or introspection, that is the very first thing that we have to do, to, to bind the names of things, the order and their, their nature to, to the aggregates themselves. Okay, before that, the alternative case. Let's say that, that uh, we're programming in Java that uh, has a wonderful set of uh, um, reflection uh, capabilities. However, you will have the penalty of using them. That will be a runtime penalty. You may not want to, to incur it. The code is now resilient because it doesn't matter how it changes. Um, the reflection API will take care of uh, making things that everything is consistent. The links between the identifiers and the nature of the stuff is actually a part of uh, the data that the program can handle. But uh, the compiler does not gain any extra information. You're not telling it anything that it didn't know that will help or not to optimize. I think it is a missed opportunity if uh, the uh, introspection data is available at compilation time that you had to wait in a language such as Java for the runtime to let you use it. So if we achieve compilation time introspection, then we conceivably may achieve uh, code which is as efficient as uh, possible because 
The compiler will have all the instruments to, to make it efficient, and at the same time will be resilient. This is something that actually I think happens frequently because uh, even before I made uh, this effort on uh, implementing introspection for MDP3, recurrently I had been trying to serialize data and uh, doing things that require introspection. And uh, I just uh, I had the sense that uh, when uh, the, the world uh, publishes a specification that needs to be uh, put in a computer, it will give you something in a language uh, agnostic way. And um, that, uh, that agnosticism means that you have to translate it to C++ somehow. And uh, then a code generator is the perfect kind of tool to do the, the, the uh, translation. So um, the translators from specifications to C++ are not money makers, so we want to, to spend as little as possible on them. But we want to make full use of them. And um, it's not the place to do optimizations, in my opinion, because uh, uh, what you think you are solving in terms of performance at the code generator may be a fallacy. You can change Instead of just uh, converting the specification from uh, uh, something to C++, you may do it in ways that uh, make it much harder to the later stages of use of the code or whatever to, to optimize or, or all those things. So it, it can truly be a pessimization. And uh, I want uh, to keep things clean. I want separation of concerns. The compiler is good at optimizing. The code generator should concern itself only with, uh, with uh, the conversion of the specification to C++. That way you can trust that uh, the conversion of the specification is correct because uh, you didn't complicate it uh, with uh, optimization um, concerns. All right, so going back to the, to the example that we had before, uh, yeah, I came up with uh, the building blocks that you see on the screen for implementing this very simple serialization requirement. So I have a template called members that uh, takes a type, and that template is empty. I have a template to bind an index to a type and a value of that type. And the T, the, the type in this uh, template, is going to be a, an address of a member pointer. Uh, we will see that uh, in use in a minute. And uh, if you see member binding, basically all the members that it has is uh, uh, to rename their template arguments, the template parameters inside. And um, I, to capture several types, I have a, a struct uh, pack, which uh, you can use tuple if you don't like it, but uh, I, love, I, I really like uh, uh, one-line declarations that convey a, a very clear idea. So I just do that instead of using uh, the standard tuple. All right, there are, very, there are many uh, uh, weird things in there. Members is an empty template. Pack is an empty variadic template. Member binding only declares internally its own template parameters. And uh, we see that strange pattern of uh, type name t, t val. So how is that possible to be uh, useful in any way? I want to go to a parenthesis, but per perhaps I'm going to skip to the point where those things are used. And. Um, this is an example of what uh, something like my code generator does. So it generates the structure that's going to represent some aggregate in the specification that, that it is translating. And um, what I am doing is to specialize that empty angle brackets being the, uh, an specialization in this case, the template members on the aggregate and internally, I'm going to say, okay, the type of that uh, specialization is going to be a pack that contains two types. Those types are the, the binding of the address of uh, member one 
and zero, and uh, the other one is uh, the address of member two. Then I go and say, in this specialization, I am saying what is uh, the name of the aggregate, and uh, I declare a function called names that is an array, but basically it's just gonna return an array, or is an array, with the names of the members. So this is an idea of how to use it, so um, I want to go back to, to the parentheses. Uh, in my opinion, metaprogramming is weird. And um, one of the reasons is that, number one, it is declarative as opposed to imperative, and uh, it borrows more from uh, functional programming than uh, the kind of programming that we are used to in uh, C++. Um, by the way, if you see in my slides, um, the color yellow, that means uh, uh, those are advice uh, that uh, I'm trying to give. So those are my opinions expressed as advice. Uh, in my opinion, you should learn concepts such as prologues unification, because that is what uh, in the C++ world is called uh, uh, substitution, and uh, it is much simpler to learn unification in uh, Prolog and th then come up with truly complicated patterns than do it in C++ with all of the attendant uh, paraphernalia of uh, the other things that C++ does. For functional programming, Haskell would be great. Uh, in, in the world of templates, everything is immutable. You cannot change. Once you have declared something, uh, that thing cannot change ever. Um, and pattern matching is prominent too. And uh, those are things that we don't uh, normally program with in C++, but uh, they are very, very frequent in functional programming. And um, uh, working with variadic templates is uh, uh, just uh, work with the head of the list and uh, the tail of the list, just like you would uh, the fundamental data type of uh, the whole of the Lisp uh, programming language. Okay, when I mean weird, I try to convey also that it's fun, because uh, you face challenges that uh, will have you learn, and um, you, you learn not just C++, but uh, much more. Um, I have to, to uh, uh, give an acknowledgement to Stephen Dewhurst that um, I, I was uh, fortunate uh, to attend one of his presentations when um, I was working at uh, Bloomberg LP in New York. By the way, any uh, Bloomberg LP uh, employee in the audience? Nobody? Oh, excellent. So um, in this presentation, uh, we had a brief conversation afterwards, and uh, he was telling me that uh, C++ is so amazing because um, all of the metaprogramming stuff was discovered or invented. It was not designed for it. So that, that got me thinking. How is it possible that something is so powerful that uh, lets you go in, 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 in totally unexpected uh, directions? And uh, that's part of the inspiration of uh, learning to learning C++ on a, on a deeper level because um, um, if you just have a practical attitude to it, these complications may uh, put you off and uh, you think that uh, it is uh, not good for you to use your time in it. Maybe not. Maybe you are tapping into uh, things that may uh, let you go in uh, completely un unexpected directions. And um, uh, Walter Brown uh, at CPPCon two years ago inspired me to someday uh, have an audience like I have today because um, he was presenting his invention of uh, Void T. And um, I thought that the idea was so subtle and simple at the same time, that uh, that's again like a, the, the, the richness of uh, C++ that is so unexpected. This is like a, C++ is practical for me, but uh, it is another thing too. Um, this subject matter is at the edges of uh, the language. We, sometimes in uh, uncharted territory and uh, the good thing about it may be that uh, you can become a, uh, an accidental pioneer yourself. Uh, it for, so, for sure will give you a different appreciation of uh, why the language it is the way that it is and uh, the evolution that it is uh, uh, having. I hope that um, you will discover that the techniques to do metaprogramming are independently useful. 
and uh, it may be a, a, a worthy fight. So going back to what we were doing before, these guys over here, all three of them are just the structural patterns, the structural things, structural templates that uh, let you um, declare things and uh, through their declarations, it is uh, that uh, you accomplish something practical. Well, bear in mind of this uh, slide, what has just happened? Aggregate has been decorated with extra information. It is not intrusive. You don't need to put things into aggregate to decorate it. You decorate it outside. So here's a, an interesting thing. When uh, you have a template uh, specialization, you can, in a way, augment arbitrarily the things of uh, your uh, type argument. And uh, we will see later in the examples how you use uh, the decoration in a trivial way by just uh, saying, hey, members T, uh, what is your name? All right. Um, one uh, little tip of recommendation here when I say the names, it is a function, a uh, class function as opposed to a uh, data member. It's just because uh, otherwise you will have to define it and link against it. If you put it uh, as an static member, then you don't have to do any of that. And uh, there's no performance penalty, it's not threat sensitive, so it's just fine. Names is also a runtime tool. So are we not talking about compilation time introspection? Yes, but what are you gonna do with the name of something at compilation time? I don't have an answer for that question, so I just uh, uh, defer to runtime for uh, the, um, the strings of the names of stuff. Um, another weird thing is that uh, the language currently doesn't have a way to specify with a single parameter, single template uh, parameter, both the type of a member pointer and the member pointer. So every member will necessarily require two template parameters, the type and uh, the value of uh, the address of the member pointer itself. And um, the simplest way, I guess, is to just tackle type it, like I do in um, the declaration of uh, the member type for uh, member binding. And of course, the zero and the one mean uh, the relative uh, position has members uh, within the aggregate. Okay, how are we gonna do that? How are we going to convert that to string? This is the first example that I'm gonna show you. Uh, this is a complete example. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, Uh, in the line that says using m equals members t, that is when I begin to use the specialization and all of its extra information. So from m, I can uh, uh, get the name of uh, that thing, the, that aggregate. Look, oh, please observe that uh, the, um, the, the t type uh, is a non-restricted type. So I just go and say, okay, give me the decoration of uh, that type. And if it doesn't have the decoration, then of course it will explode, it will not uh, run. Uh, but uh, if you call a template with a, a, an argument that it's not valid, the same thing will happen. So uh, no surprise here. Um, and now I am going to call a funny function that I called print pack. So, I am gonna forward the same value that I am trying to print, but I'm doing something funny here, which is to pass in a parameter of uh, m colon colon type, which is the pack, remember? The pack is uh, the thing that binds the, the members to the aggregate using uh, the member binding template. null pointer. So, by doing that, I allow 
the overload mechanism to select between an empty pack, which is uh, here in the middle, and um, or the uh, the case in which uh, the print pack has uh, at least a head in the list. So even though um, print pack uh, is a, uh, a template that potentially has one, two, three, four, five arguments, and of which uh, one of them is a uh, uh, a, a variadic uh, list of types. It doesn't matter because uh, the um, oh, I have a typo here. Sorry about the confusion. I was telling you that um, uh, there are a bunch of um, uh, template uh, parameters, but in the call, I don't, I'm not using any specifications of uh, template uh, parameters. So this is a very important recommendation. When you're using function templates, please make it so that uh, you deduce automatically all of the template uh, parameters. If you do that, chances are that uh, you're doing it well. So the part of uh, this uh, null pointer, that is not just a null pointer, that is a type of null pointer. And that conveys all the information needed to capture the first uh, selection of the general case. And from then, I get what is the type of the aggregate, what is the type of uh, the member, the value of the member, the index and the rest to recurse. So what I do is to use that information in a normal way by just uh, using the, the, the insertion operator and uh, then I will recur on the tail of uh, the um, list of types that I had before. And believe it or not, that's all we need. That's gonna do the right thing. So to recapitulate this part, because this is very important, this is the takeaway of the whole session. The, um, the print pack is a template function. It takes three arguments, the output stream, the aggregate value, and a pointer to uh, something that doesn't have a name. It's not, not even used in the definition block because all I care about it is uh, its type. enough template parameters to fully indicate uh, the aggregate type, the pack of the member bindings, the first member binding, and the rest, etc. cetera. Uh, callers to print pack do not specify template parameters. This uh, trick of uh, using a null pointer uh, with a type is a form of type injection. So you put an extra parameter that doesn't do anything at runtime, but it conveys information, in particular the type. It is probably the most practical way to, to deal with uh, uh, parameters to template functions. So please uh, try to make it that way. Uh, observe that the implementation is recursive. And uh, the recursion ends by calling a more specific overload but please do not confuse a more specific overload, which is uh, here the one for the empty pack. Do not confuse a more specific overload with a, spe a more specialized template. The two things are very different. Well, there also complicate things a little bit. What if a uh, I want uh, to have an example of uh, serialization in which uh, the members themselves can be aggregates that have their own members and all the whatnot. Well, that is a big complication because now we have to make a differentiation between the types that are decorated and the types that are not decorated. And um, uh, we will learn 
I will, or I will show you techniques to do exactly that. The way to make a, this uh, recognition is uh, through overloads. You have to do an overload. There must, there must be a, a fall through case. And uh, if you're doing overloads, you need to have very good knowledge of uh, how the, 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 um, the um, resolution happens. And uh, you may have the problem that uh, eventually you resort to trial and error. And uh, it has happened to me many times, the compilers, the different compiler versions have subtle bugs that uh, make you lose a lot of time. One general recommendation is, once you understand the concept of void T that we will talk about uh, later, use it. It is like a, a, a chainsaw to clear a forest of complications. Void T. Um, are you able to read the, the very first uh, red line in the, in the slides? That's all. Void T is a variadic template that takes uh, any number of types and it aliases void. It seems that it's not uh, good for anything. However, it is one of the most subtle and uh, powerful concepts that I ever seen in C++. How are we gonna use it? It's gonna be used in function arguments to detect whether these template parameters are valid types. Void T is used to detect whether its uh, template parameters are valid. What happens when they are valid? That if you put it, let's say, in a um, in a function overload, then th that overload continues to be valid for the resolution set and um, the viable set. And um, if it is not, if one of the types in there is not uh, uh, valid, the, there's um, something called a substitution failure is gonna happen, meaning that the compiler tries to match the template arguments to a template and it cannot do that that is substitution failure, and uh, this is not an error. That's why Fine is called Fine. The point is that um, that overload will be deleted from the, the valid set. One recommendation is to use a, a void T pointer in the function declaration, but do not default them. Why? Because even though that forces you to inject a null pointer at the call side, using a, a defaulted uh, parameter, gives you two overloads. The rules of resolution for overloads are complicated enough. By you using a default parameter, you multiply by two the number of cases. So I think as a practical recommendation, whenever possible, don't do that. Remember that overloads with ellipses are the overloads of last resort. That is why if a uh, I can match the overload at top, I will use it. If I can't, I will use this one. So that is the way to, the, to recognize uh, the pattern of uh, a, a type having a, uh, an over, an specialization on the, uh, b b having the member specialization for it. Because um, I am requiring on the first case that the type type name members t colon colon type is valid. So the whole void t needs to be valid. And if it is not, then that gets deleted and the only one that survives is the other. So um, the, the call sites are gonna put in a void pointer explicitly. But, so both overloads on this uh, slide can match. But again, the, the one that doesn't have the ellipses uh, wins the, the overload resolution. All right, let's try to see if we can go for a complete example.
this is what I prepared for you as an example. And um, um, this is an extract of what my code generator generates. So you can see here that uh, it has much more of uh, what uh, we have uh, seen so far. But if you go online, you will realize that uh, in this particular example, it's not being used. Oh, actually, this is not the right example. Uh, okay, so um, we are putting together the things that we have been talking about. Um, we have the members, uh, the member binding, and so on. Now, instead of uh, having had we had before the um, the simple case of um, an aggregate that has uh, just uh, members. Now we're going to uh, define a sub-aggregate that contains a, a value. Since it is a, an aggregate that has introspection itself, we're going to decorate it by uh, providing its a member binding, uh, the name, uh, the array of um, uh, member names. And we use it here. And um, so uh, this would be our... Um, um, our new uh, pack. Now we have three members, and so on. This ends what the code generator will work, will, will, will do for you. Now it's going to begin what I would call the introspection library code. And I have the two cases that I described uh, in the slide uh, before a print pack function that is going to do the traversal the way that, uh, that I uh, explained to you. And look that um, what we're doing here is uh, we're recurring in two different ways. We will recur for the members on uh, to string implementation, which is the one that does the work. And uh, we are also going to recur by uh, going to take care of uh, the, um, the rest of the list. So uh, this ends uh, the recursion for the packs the case in which uh, the, the to string impl when uh, the type T does have an specialization members for it will do the same stuff that uh, it was uh, doing before. And uh, I have to string that um, we'll call to string impl by augmenting the list of arguments with um, more parameters. So what I'm doing here is to use trampolines. Two string input would be a trampoline for, for uh, the string because uh, you're changing the types. So the, the process of uh, changing the types is uh, very useful. All right, uh, and um, we have a simple example. So let's compile that. It does. I don't know if you guys can uh, read uh, from the distance, but we do get uh, the um, the output that uh, we were expecting. Questions so far? Would be a good time to ask questions if you need them. Okay, there are many ways that we can improve this code. Um, we can uh, uh, also uh, do introspection on um, instance and class functions. We can take advantage of uh, inheritance in many ways. Uh, we can do compile time selections of subsets of the members. Sometimes, let's say that you, you want to care only about uh, a certain subset of the members. Um, you can do semantic aware serialization, like uh, I do in the more general example that I'm going to show you later. 
uh, you can forward the configuration options to the serialization primitives. There are many things that you can improve in here. But uh, we have to skip because uh, I want to show you three other examples. So the null values in MDB3 is application specific. And um, I hope that uh, you see that it has generality. So in, in the specification of uh, MDP3, there are three different ways in which uh, a value is allowed to be null. Um, normal types that uh, have a, a magic value. Is, so if uh, you receive a data item whose uh, member is uh, an optional that has that magic value, then you know that uh, it is not really there. It's, it's got to be there because of the encoding, but uh, the applications will ignore because uh, it doesn't have it. Um, something like uh, enumerations, in this case, that uh, they have the null value enumerator. The unions have a member null value and its value is true. And um, I say three plus one types because um, the aggregates that contain things that may be null, well, if all of these members are null, if, uh, then the whole aggregate uh, would be null and I program that. This will allow me to show you what the compiler does with introspection. Okay, um, for the first case, I characterize them by using uh, the template optional that has a, a type uh, parameter and a value of that type. An example would be integer to null is uh, an optional for, from integer to in which uh, that constant uh, represents the magic value. Again, this is just a structural pattern. Um, I did something that uh, I shouldn't have done, but uh, I did, which is uh, I implemented uh, the gist of uh, std enable if, and uh, it's very simple. Um, I'm gonna show it to you because uh, the ideas, just like void t, once you understand them, you can uh, uh, use them aplenty and uh, they become natural. Uh, it is an empty template and uh, specialized on true. So when it is true, it does have a type member. And uh, the true without the input is just uh, uh, the aliasing. So that I don't have to be writing type name through input on the parameter colon colon type. So I just use uh, uh, true. Um, and uh, these are my two. Um, so I need to declare a function is null, then I am allowing it to be a, a const expression uh, function. In the case that um, the template overload satisfies the property of uh, the argument being an optional, I'm just gonna check against uh, the magic value. And here are the other cases. Number one is uh, the, uh, oh, the other cases require a trampoline and um, it is named uh, is null impulse. The first case is just a fall through with ellipses. So if none of the others succeed, this is the one that's gonna be taken. The, um, the, 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 the second uh, overload is the one that takes care of uh, enumerations. So I am requiring that the type has argument is uh, an enumerated type by using the type trait is enum. And uh, once I know that uh, that thing is an enumerated value, I'm gonna try to use its a uh, null value member and compare it to, to, to the argument to the function. <coughs> Um, in the case of uh, a union, the second, the, the next uh, overload, the third overload, I have uh, also a, the property of um, it being a union, and um, I must check whether the, the union value, the, the union member null value is true. And uh, finally, I call is null implementation on uh, 
a more complicated uh, thing, which is the case in which uh, the type of the argument has an specialization members, and uh, I will call package null on them. Another trampoline. The way to reverse, to traverse the members is just the same as in serialization. So I'm not gonna go over them again. But um, for uh, completeness sake, uh, uh, this is the call. Um, it's just basically the same, uh, well, I'm gonna end up doing it anyway. Uh, just traversing, uh, uh, taking care of the head and uh, traversing to the, the tail. So that's what can, takes care of uh, the aggregates. Let's hear a performance experiment. This is a type that comes from the specification itself. Maturity month year has uh, four members and they, they each can be null. So, um, what do you think uh, the, uh, if, if I, uh, uh, what is your name, sorry? Me? Yeah? Uh, Chris. Chris, do you have an expectation of what is the assembler that's gonna be generated for the function fun? Okay. Does anybody have an expectation? What will be the assembler for uh, that function? Calling is null. What is that that the assembler is going to do? Well, I'm going to show you. It just does four comparisons. So, all of the techniques of uh, recursion on the list of members, the extra argument in the type injection the trampolines to recognize the patterns, all of them disappear from the object code. Of course, that we are optimizing, but uh, uh, the, the, it, it disappeared. Since uh, you may not be entirely convinced, I'm just gonna try to run an online example. Hopefully it's gonna work. using the excellent tool of uh, the GCC Compiler Explorer. And uh, that's what uh, uh, GCC 6 uh, generates uh, with optimization. Without optimization, of course, it's gonna be a, a nightmare. It's taking a long time and everything. Come on. So, well, this is a case in which uh, my internet failed or Oh, that, that is the output of uh, the case of, uh, it, it came uh, in the wrong order. Um, this, is, this is correct because um, you may want to uh, do debugging. Uh, debugging code and metaprogramming is uh, extremely hard because this is the kind of things that you're gonna be deb debugging on. Okay. <coughs> What about if I put uh, that, uh, I'm gonna set one of the values to five. Shouldn't the compiler automatically realize that uh, the whole aggregate is not gonna be null because uh, at least one of its members isn't? That is exactly what happens. Why does this happen? Because uh, the compiler knows that weak must be different to 255 and that comes because the code generator put it in, but the introspection moved the effort to traverse the members from the code generator to a no performance penalty in C++. That's one of the benefits of uh, saving work that I've done. We can program is null at any time. It wasn't uh, at the time that, that uh, we programmed the, the code generator. So you can extend things. You can extend things uh, uh, regardless of uh, uh, the code generator. Uh, you don't need to modify it either. You can override this library with overloads of your own for your own types or types of the specification that you want uh, the behavior to be different. If you would using a, if, if if you would be using a code generator that didn't have any generality into it, no generic programming, then probably it would be uh, overloads for each specific type, and that would prevent you from overloading them again. 
So you would be out of luck. Also, the compiler has more visibility into what's going on. Well, um, it is uh, just uh, five minutes to end the session. And uh, what I had prepared for you um, are reiterations of aspects of uh, what I've showed you before, but they are increasingly more complex. We're going to go over them. And um, in MDP3, there are messages, and I characterize them by making them a specialization using an ID of a template message T. Um, the, the messages have nested data. They have a, a arrays, and uh, they can be more than one subarray. So before going into more complicated stuff, this is a very simple example of uh, what a message would, uh, would look like. And uh, what I'm doing here is uh, um, I'm just going to define pattern as something that uh, will try to discriminate between uh, the thing having a message on that idea specialized or not. So in the case of um, message on 88, it is specialized and has a type int. The case of uh, message 109 does not. So if I said, if I try to see the values of uh, the array that I am declaring at the bottom, <coughs> the pattern on zero should be the one that doesn't have the specialization, which is one. The pattern on 88 should be one, uh, sorry, should be two because uh, this has a, a message ID type. The case for 109, even though it is specialized, the specialization doesn't have a member type type, so it's, it's got to be 1, and 200 is just like 0. That is exactly what uh, the assembler is going to uh, show you if uh, you run it uh, on your own. One uh, thing to take into account is that um, uh, here I'm using defaulted uh, template arguments. That is different to defaulted overloads because uh, they change the arity. The technique that I'm using is explained in the slides. We can see the, the code in the GitHub that is linked to in the presentation uh, to see the to stream weak message entry point for how the, the whole thing of uh, printing the nested data. I just wanted to finish the presentation with an example of a dispatcher. It's a very simple thing. Like I told you before, the messages are characterized by being a specialization on an integer on the message template. And uh, the stroke uh, uh, dispatcher defines a table to dispatch. So it's a like table of functions. If I receive a message of uh, type uh, 55, let's say, then I'm going to run whatever it is at the slot uh, 55. I don't put that code there because um, it's not needed, but uh, the, um, an example would be like a, I have a structured something that will be like a, my manager of uh, market messages, whatever arbitrary, and I have a function that is going to consume messages of uh, the ID 88, and they want to take a, 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 a void pointer context to convert it into the something. So this is what uh, lets you uh, work in a more uh, uh, intelligent way. So what I am writing in this uh, slide is a, a very simple subscription pattern. And um, um, the way to use it, I wrote an example, which is just to subscribe the uh, use the uh, uh, call subscribe, which is a template function on uh, the function consume 88. So please observe that I am not indicating explicitly what is the ID of the message that uh, is going to be consuming. Why? Because um, it is uh, uh, taken by the overload resolution. So what we have seen in this last example is that uh, this preserves the type safety. There's no performance penalty. There are no complications that this was done in, in user code. Well, these are uh, the acknowledgments of Riga 
And um, if you want to know more about uh, subject covered in this uh, presentation, you can go to my blog. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much.